So you guys know I love my dress watches and Grand Seiko has been having its moment in the limelight. But in this video, let's see if the watchmaker's watchmaker has something to say about that. Hey guys, I'm Max and this is Watch Crunch. So someone started a one watch challenge about a week ago on watchcrunch.com and it's been hilarious. So the goal is to wear one watch for as long as you can and see if you can outlast your fellow members. We started with about 50 people. I only lasted a day, but some people are hanging on for dear life, for glory and for prizes. So I feel like we've been living through the age of the sports watch, but the tides are turning a little bit. I, for example, I'm hearing less and less about integrated bracelets, and I feel like we're seeing a resurgence of the dressier style. And this trend to me is led by no other than Grand Seiko. Now to me, the natural Swiss counterpart to Grand Seiko would be JLC. Both revered brands make craftsmanship their number one priority. So in this video, we're gonna pit two 39 millimeter dress watches against each other, the JLC Master Ultra Thin Moon and the Grand Seiko SBGY 007 Omi Watari. And we're gonna see who makes the better dress watch for around 10 grand. I'm gonna break this head to head down to four categories. The Dalla Hands, because those are the main events in any dress watch. The Movements, uh, case and wearability, and lastly, the history of each company. Now, if we have a tie, I will throw it over to the judges, which is me, who will then decide subjectively which is the better dress watch. Why me? Because it's my video, deal with it. So Grand Seiko has made a name for itself with fancy dials, and if you are a dial guy, the game is over before it began. This bluish silver backdrop on the SBGY 007 is the highlight of the show and is said to resemble the surface of Lake Suwa, where the watch factory is based, during wintertime when the lake freezes over and long ridges appear over the frozen surface. Legend has it that these are the markings of the Omi Watari, or the footprints of the gods. The texture of the style matches those pious undertones with flowing ridges that run horizontally and almost shimmer as you rotate the watch against the light. And atop this dramatic dial rests elongated hour markers and we get impossibly sharp, flat, polished hands with beveled sides. A blue second hand sweeps effortlessly over that placid surface. The JLC, on the other hand, serves up a simpler silvery white dial. But don't be fooled, simple does not equal basic. In fact, so much of the dress watch aesthetic is about saying a lot with a little. This extremely fine silvery texture is further enhanced as the dial slopes down towards the edge, adding visual depth. The dolphin style hands are exquisitely detailed with a texture finish along one half and polished on the other. The blue second hand is even thinner than the Grand Seiko, like a sewing needle, elegantly stretching to the edge of the dial. Now, a couple of additional complications are found at the six. We have a moon phase that is surrounded by a circular date wheel. To operate them, there are two tiny pushers embedded to either side of the case. Now, I must say, I don't really see the utility of a moon phase in modern day life. I guess for anyone who's not an astronomer or a werewolf, but as far as complications go, the moon phase has to be one of the most classic and attractive on a dress watch. So in the dial category, I can't really pick a winner. So we'll call it a tie. Okay, so let's change gears a bit and quickly compare the history of these two companies. So Seiko was founded in 1881. Since then, Seiko has had many achievements to its name. There was the famous story of how Grand Seiko and King Seiko outdueled the Swiss at the observatory timing trials. And maybe infamously with the introduction of the Astron in 1969, Seiko ushered in the age of the quartz watch. And we all know the carnage that followed. But as inspirational as Seiko's trials and tribulations are in the 1800s, Kentaro Hitori was emulating the watch manufacturers of Switzerland. One of the oldest and most respected has always been JLC, founded about a half century before Seiko. Please don't make me pronounce their full name. 
With over 400 patents and 1300 unique calibers to its name, JLC is known as the watchmaker's watchmaker. Meaning if you needed a movement back then, you called JLC. Well, I guess they didn't have phones, so FaceTime? But JLC did have the Reverso, the world's first sports watch. But even today, the company prides itself in building some of the world's most complicated movements with gyro tourbillons, minute repeaters, and other grand complications. So on the history front, we have to give this one to JLC. Guys, if you're enjoying the content on this channel, please help us out. Do all those YouTube things like liking this video, subscribing, and also leave me a comment if you disagree with any of the results. You won't hurt my feelings. So now let's talk movements. Now you think with all that we've said, JLC has to have this one in the bag. It beats at four hertz, gets 70 hours of power reserve in its latest iteration. It's also a feast for the eyes when you flip the watch over with a big skeletonized pink gold rotor and superb finishing on all the surfaces. Now one thing to note is that this rotor, it's kind of loud, but not in a harsh way. It gives off kind of a fine mechanical winding sound that reminds you of the precisely tuned machine under the hood. Now Grand Seiko has brought a dark horse to this mechanical race. The 9R31 is a manually wound spring drive movement. Though much of the gear train is hidden under a large steel plate, it's nevertheless finely finished with exposed blue screw heads, red rubies, and a power reserve meter at the top right quadrant. A large barrel houses a double mainspring that delivers three full days of power. To me, spring drive is the perfect marriage of mechanical and quartz, giving us a perfectly smooth sweeping second hand and accuracy of one second per day. Next to the JLC, this is like alien technology from the future. And for that reason, spring drive gets the point. On to our final category. Let's focus on the cases in terms of both fit and finish, as well as how they wear on the wrist. So both are mostly polished. The Grand Seiko does have a bit of brushing on the sides, but the JLC definitely has a more elegant dress watch aesthetic. In fact, next to each other, it makes the Grand Seiko case look sporty. Now everything is thinner on the JLC from the bezel to the lugs with more interacting surfaces that just makes this case feel more thought out. The lugs do jut out a little bit. I can't help but wish that this watch was just a couple millimeters smaller. The Grand Seiko case on the other hand looks simpler and more traditional. We get big flat polished surfaces on the bezel and the top of the lugs to show off that mirror like Zaratsu polishing. But so much surface area also gives it a bit of a flat pancake look. The Grand Seiko definitely wears better on the wrist though owing to its shorter 43 millimeter lug to lug distance. It also has a bigger more confident crown to operate. So on the case front, both watches have their merits and shortcomings, and this one will also have to be a tie. Well, what do you know? We have an even race. It's like I planned it, but we'll have to throw it over to the judge's decision. Me again. So which watch would I reach for on the day of a big job interview or a wedding to attend? And intuitively, I'm going to have to say the JLC. It just feels like a more pure expression of a dress watch. But as an overall everyday watch, I think the Grand Seiko doesn't feel as delicate and probably is the more practical choice. But that wasn't the question, was it? We're talking dress watches. And as a famous watch cruncher once said, at this point, I don't need a go anywhere, do anything watch. I only want specialized watches. But what's your ultimate dress watch? Share with us on watchcrunch.com. I'll put a link to the topic in the pinned comments below. As always, stay crunchy. I'll see you in the next one.